I'm Lara Land, somatic coach and yoga teacher trainer, and this is the Beyond Trauma podcast. What a couple of years we have had. The challenges continue to grow, and more and more of us are experiencing some level of traumatic stress. My commitment here is to bring you the most up-to-date insights on exactly how trauma affects our mind-body-spirit system and how we can work with our bodies to soften its impacts. You will be hearing from trauma survivors and researchers, and together, we are going to incorporate what they have to teach us to heal ourselves and promote the well-being of all those around us. Here we go. It's out! The Essential Guide to Trauma-Sensitive Yoga is now available everywhere books are sold. This is the book for every yoga teacher, studio, and practitioner who wants to incorporate an inclusive practice to yoga. It's available on my website, laraland.us, and everywhere books are sold. If you're loving this podcast, you are going to love this book. An exciting first on the Beyond Trauma podcast, we have two guests today. They work together which is something I want to point out because it is so helpful and important in any of the helper healing professions. If you can find someone to work with, what a great thing to fill in gaps and to, you know, open our perspective and bounce ideas off of and for that needed support that we need, especially in those professions. So very, very cool. I have on today Anne Beckley Forrest and Annie Monaco, and I have them on to talk about complex trauma, childhood trauma. What does trauma look like when it shows up in children? And we actually discussed so much more than that. We ended up getting to the root of attachment figures. What does it look like for a child to be securely attached to that parent? Um, what happens when the parent is not attuned with the child, and how we can fix it. So this is a great episode for anyone that works with or has children. And we also talk about teenage years, so not just the little ones. And we discuss a very specific modality, one that I've been learning about a bit at school called play therapy. And what was great about this is, for me, is I've been exposed to child-centered play therapy, which is very non-directive, but their approach is a little more directive. It's specifically for trauma. So um, working with kids to really lean in and going there to those dark places in order to process the trauma and move on from it. And they also use EMDR with their play therapy in a very unique combination. What a skill set. And as they say, we need more of these kind of providers. So if you're coming out of school and you're thinking, what should be my specialty? This might be it. You're going to love this. Like I said, this one is for everyone. We all have a little one somewhere in our life. So the guests today are Anne Beckley Forrest, a licensed clinical social worker in private practice in Buffalo, New York. Her specialties include attachment and child and adolescent trauma. She also works with adult survivors. She's certified in EMDR and is an EMDR approved consultant and trainer and a faculty member of the Child Trauma Institute, as well as a registered play therapist and supervisor and approved provider of play therapy continuing education through the Association for Play Therapy. She provides consultation in person and remotely and gives trainings locally and internationally and is the co-founder of Playful EMDR an online hub for training and consultation. Her primary interest is in the intersection of play therapy and EMDR, and she's published on this topic, including as co-editor of EMDR with children in the play therapy room, an integrated approach. And she uh, was a co-contributor, co-editor to that with Annie Monaco, who's a licensed clinical social worker, a registered play therapist, and a faculty member of both the Child Trauma Institute and of University at Buffalo School of Social Work. Annie's travels throughout the U.S. and internationally, providing trauma-informed trainings and agency and therapist consultation. 
She's a trainer of EMDR, progressive counting and attachment and dissociation. She's a contributor and co-editor of the book, EMDR with Children in the Play Therapy Room, an integrated approach. She has excessive training in complex trauma, family therapy, play therapy, and restorative justice, and over 25 years experience in serving children, teens, families, and adults. Her private practice in Amherst, New York includes complex issues such as foster care, out-of-country adoptions, juvenile justice, and dissociation. She's also the co-founder of Playful EMDR, an online hub for training and consultation. You're going to really love how they bounce ideas off each other, and I jump in there as well. Here we go. Wonderful. Here we go. We are back. My first episode with multiple guests. This is very exciting. We have on today Annie Monaco and Anne Beckley Forrest, and they were highly recommended to me by previous guest, um, Rodham, who came on and spoke to us about uh, EMDR. And so that's always great. Always love when we have guests recommended. So thank you too for coming on. And I have lots of questions for you today, but thank you first for making this time. We are excited to be here. Thank you for inviting us on. We we are happy to be here and just provide any information that you would see helpful for your guests. I really appreciate that. Like I was explaining to you before, I think uh, we cover a lot of different kinds of trauma on this show. I just had someone come on to talk specifically about secondary trauma. Um, and with the two of you, I really wanted to focus on and see if you could share with us what is complex trauma? What is trauma do specifically when uh, it it's occurs in childhood? Yeah, so uh, that's actually such an important question because the word, even the word trauma tends to be something that it's hard for us to relate to. It's like something that happens to other people or happens in war, but children, you know, are they don't have a lot of experience with the world. So even the kinds of things that other people might not think of as traumatic can leave their mark on the developing brain. And especially in early childhood is where we're forming our beliefs about ourselves and about the world. And so when we start to talk about complex trauma, what we often are talking about is either repetitive events where there wasn't enough time to kind of integrate and recover in between, or there wasn't the right kind of support, you know, between different kinds of bad things that happen. And then it becomes a kind of cumulative effect. And that can lead to all sorts of symptoms and all sorts of, you know, a lot of negative feelings about who I am and my place in the world. And those have lifetime implications. Um, And also we know now that has lifetime implications even on our physical health as well. So in particularly hard, I've seen in the, you know, both kids and adults I've worked with is when the bad things that happen, happen at home or they happen because of things that like the parents are struggling with or things like that, those are really, those can be very hard to shake. So um, that's where we really start to get in some of that complexity. And I didn't really say much about dissociation, Annie, but maybe you want to pick that up. Yeah. So dissociation is something that comes out of every traumatic event. And so every single person who has ever experienced any kind of trauma will dissociate. So that word is very complex to explain. And I'm going to give examples because that's always easier to understand dissociation. But it means you kind of, you lose time for a couple of seconds. You check out, you fade out. Like I remember many years ago, I had a very serious car accident and I just remember going blank, right? I missed, I missed probably 10 minutes of what happened, you know, when emergency responders came to help me. And so it's just a natural way that our body manages stress. If you think about deer, when they get frozen in headlights, that's dissociation. That's always the easiest way to understand that. So does that help, Lara? Yeah, it sounds like that's one of the main things that you see in, in children who have experienced trauma. Yeah, children, everybody, every single person. So all of us experience dissociation. And it could be for a second, it could be for 10 minutes, it could be a lot longer, you know, depending on the trauma. You think of some of the horrific things that have happened around the world. So people can dissociate for long periods of time. And then the tough part of dissociation is people can continue to use that strategy as a way to cope. 
Yeah, but the most important thing to understand is that it's a very natural response to when something difficult has happened, is to check out, to get frozen, you can't move. Lots of different symptoms can go with it, but it's all very natural in the way our body manages stress. Yeah, yeah. Right. If you're a kid and you're having lots of traumatic events, you can see how that could sort of become your go-to. Yeah, to kind of not engage anymore, but really yeah. separate so that you don't have to feel the pain. A great way to say it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that it's particularly you know, particularly harmful for kids when the traumatic events are happening at home. I know that having that primary uh, attachment figure, that person you can tr- you can trust at home is very important for us. We are, I think developmentally, we enter the world at a much more vulnerable state than other animals. And we, we rely on a a grown up to take care of us in many ways. Maybe you can speak a little bit about that and about the importance of attachment. Go ahead, Ann. Why don't you start? Yeah, well, I had one thought kind of bubbling to the surface while you were talking. You know, it's not all one thing or all the other, generally. But, you know, most of our attachment figures are both a source of comfort and security and sometimes a source of, you know, pain and misunderstanding. And, you know, we don't have perfect parents and we don't need perfect parents to thrive, but there are characteristics of, you know, we call securely attached kids or they have caregivers who, when they mess up, they repair it, they fix it, they explain it. Uh, If they lose their temper, if they can't get there in time and kids who have less secure attachment tends to be caregivers who have impairments in some way, like maybe they drink too much or they're really stressed out by trying to provide financially. They're not around a lot. When they are around, they yell or give a lot of like punitive type punishments. And if there's not that repair, that's where kids start to learn wrong things about the world in those stressful and traumatic moments. And of course, a lot of times, you know, with complex trauma, you might be adding in actually unsafe situations that are coming in, you know, kids are entering into with, you know, caregivers who are not supervising them adequately, and then bad things happen. I'm just thinking about, you know, Annie and I have both had cases with kids, you know, it's not that their parents didn't care about them or didn't want the best for them, but because of lapses in judgment or attachment or, you know, not not being well attuned, things really get off track. be hard for kids to find their way back because then what happens is they start behaving badly and then the focus switches to the behavior. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. And thank you for clarifying there um, that it's not all one way or the other. It's so, so important, especially for parents out there like myself. Yes. We always say when we're training and we start talking about attachment, we're like, okay, if you have kids right now, just don't, just don't don't personalize everything that we're about to say because none of us are perfect parents. So, so when we mess up, we get it wrong. It's important to really look at that child and 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 say that we got it wrong. And are there certain things that we should do to make to make that repair? Yeah, I mean, I can I can think this is Annie. So I'm thinking there's lots of things, and I think owning it is the first step, right? So, you know, I think of a parent who yells for the umpteenth time about a bedroom being messy, right? And so, but this time the parent really loses it, yells, says you're never going out again, things like that, right? So that's a minor maybe example, but, you know, that parent then can go back and say, you know, listen, I had a very difficult day, very stressful day. You still have to get your room clean, but I shouldn't have yelled like that, Mm. right? Because I worry sometimes that parents think they have to give something. You know, I heard a, an ice cream conversation between a mother and a kid and whatever happened. And, and the next thing I hear the mother saying is, now the kid is having ice cream today. And so the mother goes, so tomorrow I'll bring you back here and I'll get you a double waffle cone. And, you know, and I just wanted to step in and say, no, you don't really have to do that. Yeah. You just you just need to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And I understand 
that that really upset you. Mm. So it's really owning it. It's hearing the feeling, validating the feeling, and you don't have to make up for it. Sometimes you do, but for certain situations, you really don't. Yeah, that's an important point. And I almost think like, of course, we don't want to mess up, but we do and it's human. And we maybe perhaps can even grow stronger in our relationship. And it almost can show the child that, look, I'm not perfect, you know, because kids think sometimes they idealize their parents so much. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of models for them also how they might behave, you know, when they make mistakes. Yeah. I mean, humanness is about making mistakes sometimes. And so everybody does it. And I I think if we just understood and accepted that sometimes we make mistakes, right? Of course, the things that Ann and I are working on with families in our office are much bigger attachment wounds, such as abuse, right? Physical, sexual, other kinds of things. And so when we are entering this place of large attachment wounds, a lot more has to be done to repair. And it's not as simple as saying, I'm sorry, I messed up your ice cream order, Mm -hmm. right? It's having parents really listen to what happened. So listening, hearing, validating, and sometimes parents want to go, but let me explain why I did that. And so that's the one of the things I try to say is that, of course, there's a reason why you did it, but maybe today's not the day. It's just really listening, hearing, and validating those feelings that a child has. And so once somebody, all of us feel that way. Once I feel heard by somebody, I can move forward in a relationship. So, Anne, I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, I actually was thinking, I I agree with everything you're saying, Annie. It makes perfect sense. But the other piece, which is interesting, and this has been coming up for me a lot in some work that I've been doing with with a couple different families, but it comes up something like this. Something bad happens that was no one's fault. It wasn't an error that the parent made, but in trying to like soothe the child, we sort of miss opportunities to help them digest that traumatic experience, you know, in real time. And then it's more like the kid, in order to please the parent, has to pretend that everything's fine. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) A couple of families, you know, one in particular uh, in my mind right now where, you know, a parent died while the, uh, you know, the children are young and the other parent works very hard to try to make up for that absence. But in the hard work, there's sort of like no room for the pain. And so that's another way, I think, in which sometimes we can end up with these more complicated processes after traumatic experiences is when there's such an emphasis on soothing and kind of making it all better, making it go away, buying you things to make you feel better instead of being able to sit with the pain. I think we all want to spare kids pain. And, you know, of course, as a trauma therapist, the hardest part of the job is that one of our jobs is to say, hey, we have to go back to those bad things that happen and let your brain and your body kind of digest and move through it instead of pushing it all aside or, you know, using dissociation as we were talking about before. So sometimes, you know, even by being very attentive parents, we can almost, we can deprive kids of some of the experiences they need to have in order to heal. Mm, so that's such a good point. And we don't want our children to experience pain and Sometimes it's more about us that we can't deal with their pain, (laughs) right? (laughs) So does that kind of lead to actually that um, there's another word that, you know, I hear come up a lot with childhood uh, complex trauma and um, parent-child relationship, and then the word is attunement. And you want to start on that, and then I'll jump in and add. It's good that we're, you know, we're attuned right now. We're directing traffic in our conversation, (laughs) And we're ebbing and flowing and not dominating each other. That's just a great little example right there. It's like one of those things like you, it's hard to describe it, you know, when you see it. And this idea of being able to kind of put yourself in the other person's shoes. So, you know, my kid's crying, they're upset. I wonder if it's because they're hungry. I wonder if it's because it's the last day of school. They're going to miss their friends. You know, and we don't always know the answers, but an attuned parent is kind of open to the possibilities. 
in these more wounded attachment relationships uh, or where, you know, stress or unprocessed stuff is getting in the way, you parent is more often to mistake the cue and to be like, oh, well, you know, this kid's just out to get me. They're ruining my day. This misattribution, like assuming that things are happening, are happening for a reason different than what they really are, which is often just kind of basic needs. And kids are little bundles of emotion and they're extremists. Yes. <laughs> You know, as adults who are trying to keep them safe and teach them about big feelings, we're sort of along for the ride. And I, you know, so I think a ch- part of the ingredients of attunement is kind of wearing that lightly and having some flexibility built in, not the same thing as permissiveness or, you know, kind of overcompensating for all your bad moods, but being able to kind of roll with it and um, make minute to minute adjustments based on new information, also not having like real rigid expectations. Mm. So those are some of the things I think of when I think of attunement. I can add in, you know, I I work a lot with teenagers. And so, you know, teaching parents to be attuned to teenagers because they're so much more independent. And so sometimes parents are losing that in attunement for a variety of reasons, but Teenagers are, like Ann said, you know, there's natural moodiness or things like that, but we want to stay attuned because sometimes these teenagers have big things on their mind and it comes out in a fighting with the parent or frustration, but but they're not really saying what's on their mind. And so that's where I'm really trying to teach parents. Like if your child seems off today more than normal, why don't you check in? Check in, ask about friends, ask about school, ask about boyfriend, girlfriend, ask about if anything else is going on in their brain. So I think, you know, it's, it feels like sometimes parents can be a little bit more attuned when kids are young, but they kind of start to lose that important skill that they absolutely need to have with teenagers. Mm. Such a good point. Wait, are, you, are you talking about my family? <laughs> I, I knew Anne was going <laughs> to. Do you want to share? <laughs> Not on a podcast. No, I don't think No, this uh, could take a whole <laughs> different turn. <laughs> Let's just say I'm living that at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's an excellent point. So, and, you know, again, I think we're, we're speaking really of a continuum where you have at one yeah. end kind of the normal ups and downs as yes. it flows. And then when you add in, you know, more extreme adversity, whether it's something that's happening between family members, like domestic violence or abuse, or something that's happening kind of to the family, like, you know, financial hardships and community yeah. catastrophes and things like that. You know, it's hard enough when everything's going smoothly for a family. And then when you add in some of these sources of adversity, it's challenging. Yeah. I, can I give a quick th- example, Lara? Please, Would that be okay? Please do. Yeah. You know, I, I think of a teenager right now that really got very quiet. And uh, about two months ago, a peer in the school, you know, unfortunately committed suicide. So, you know, the school attended to all the kids. The parents, you know, did what they could at home, but now it's two months later and my client is not doing okay and really come to find out that my client had said something mean to this girl several months ago. It didn't, it wasn't part of the suicide, but, but of course she felt worried that it was right. And so, you know, and maybe this was of course a picked on child. So, you know, I'm sure there was many mean comments made, but my client really was struggling with deep guilt, sadness. And of course, the parent kept going, all right, honey, you didn't mean to, you didn't mean to, right? And I said, let's just listen. Because part of that is a learning lesson, right? It's not okay to say mean things to other people because it could affect them. If multiple people are being mean to somebody, it it affects them, right? So, you know, that's what the attunement piece is. And so, Mom just kept saying, oh, she's, you know, she's not doing well. She, I, think she, I think she's depressed about her classes, right? But mom wasn't really asking too much. Mom says, well, I ask her every day how her, how her day is, mm-hmm. and she says, fine. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, and she goes, and then she just goes in her bedroom and closes the door. And I go, but this is where you have to knock on the door sometimes and say, what's going on? 
And you can't walk in going, hey, what's going on? Why are you so moody today? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So again, it's it's not just asking, but you have to ask in a way that a child's going to want to have a conversation with you, you know, and it's certainly not going to happen after you yelled at them about their bedroom and everything. So so attunement's really big skill. And you know, with busy lives, right? Everybody's busy. And so there's so much less attunement because often it's like, come on, get ready, hurry up, get in the car. We got to go. You got soccer practice. You got this. We got to get your brother here. Right. And families don't even have time to breathe, let alone attune to each other. There also is no more dinner together. Right. You know, that's an unfortunate. That's where I think a lot of attunement happened in the old days was at dinner where people got to talk about their day in a little bit more in depth. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're still doing that. I hope we keep it up. I have a four-year-old, so I know it can good, change. Good. <laughs> but I'm hearing that, all of that. <laughs> I know that when childhood complex trauma happens, that there are a lot of studies done around all the kind of uh, negative health outcomes. Of course, the famous... ACEs uh, study and so on, you know, that can happen later in life if interventions don't happen. Is there a certain window of time that it's important for the child to get to someone like one of you? Annie said, is pointing to me. We can't teach. <laughs> I know she's pointing to me because I am like on a, I'm on a crusade about this. So every minute <laughs> that a child is sitting with unprocessed traumatic experience. So by that, I mean something bad, overwhelming, scary, life-threatening happened. Either people didn't pay attention or they tried to soothe and there wasn't enough digestion to really integrate the experience. So every time that happens, whatever trauma that's not processed is interfering with growth and development every day. So waiting for things to get better is really not the best idea. All the research points to the fact that early intervention, even a little bit of support, you know, kind of moving through, and I'm using this term digestion as a kind of generic way of talking about all different kinds of therapies, all different kinds of approaches that help us to be in connection with ourselves and and these big feelings and body sensations and symptoms and things that come after traumatic experiences sooner the better, as much as possible, as soon as possible. Because especially for kids, they're missing out on windows of growth and development. Because Mm -hmm. the brain kind of gets almost stuck at that time, right? Yeah, that's a really good way of saying it, I would say. Annie, I don't I don't know if this is from you or if it's something we sometimes we you and I in our training systems talk about trauma time. Is that something you invented or do we get that from somebody else? No, that's that's actually a term in the literature. I'm not sure who said it, but yeah, trauma time is being stuck at that event. You know, I I remember meeting a 56 year old woman, and you know, she was telling me something that happened to her, something really horrific that happened to her as a child, and she looked at me and she says, "It it it feels like it's happening right now, all over again." And that's that's an that's a, a example of trauma time. But sometimes we see it in kids where they revert back to an age and it's they're often showing us maybe what happened to them for trauma. You know, sometimes we see kids what we call reenactment. And so they're acting out what happened to them. Like maybe if they were sexually touched, they're now sexually touching peers in school so this reenactment, it's they're stuck at the time of the trauma. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and even the body is kind of frozen, right? I mean, I know a lot in trauma processing part of that, because sometimes people have tried to talk about what happened, but it just, it hasn't been enough because it's fr- the body's also frozen in that moment. And so a lot of times, you know, Annie and I both do EMDR and we do a lot of play therapy techniques to support that with our clients. And it's really about, the body getting unfrozen from that moment in time too. Well, you know that I like that. (laughs) I believe it's the, you know, they used to say mind body connection and I always just get so annoyed because I'm like, it's not a connection. It's the mind body. Now I know a lot of people use the term the body mind to really encompass that. That's good. I like that. I have to steal that. 
Yeah, I like that one because it it makes it clear and um and that's such a good point. And I want to get into what you do. So that's where we're headed. So what is play therapy? <laughs> All right, I guess I'll answer that one. So it's kind of a broad question, but play therapy is really a collection of different ways of, of providing mental health care to children that involve what we call the therapeutic powers of play, which if you think about it, there's many ways in which we can use play to learn and teach things, to regulate the body, to use fantasy and imagination to kind of tiptoe closer to some of those big ideas about like anger and fear and mastery of things. So it's a pretty broad term. There's a lot of different ways to do play therapy from, you know, very non-directive and letting the child kind of use the environment to have those mastery experiences all the way to being very directive and, you know, giving prompts and ideas for projects and things that we do in therapy together. Yeah, I was really curious about that because I'm working on a master's in mental health counseling and I had a class on play therapy, just a very, like a very brief intro. And it was, it was child centered. So it was definitely non-directive. Yeah. And you know, that works great unless you're avoiding something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So go more into that. I'm very curious. Well, <laughs> well, you know, so this idea of prescriptive play therapy is like, well, we might use non-directive play therapy sometimes where the child really is uh, an environment where a lot of fantasy play can kind of bubble to the surface, especially for young kids. They can work a lot of stuff out that way unless the nervous system is phobically avoiding reminders of the trauma, in which case they won't really get to the work that they need to heal. And so as a, I'm more of a prescriptive play therapist where I might use some child-centered play, but I also sometimes have to, you know, do some things to direct the child towards the processing, towards the big feelings and the hard feelings, especially after we get our, you know, kind of a relationship established. And if we can include the parents, that's the best. So can you explain for the listeners a little bit about what it looks like? The child walks into the room and there are various items. Maybe you can share what some of the items might be and how they might interact with them. Yeah. Do you, Annie, do you want to talk about your space? You have such a big room. Ah, sure. So, <laughs> well, I, my training center, I had a training center in the pandemic hit, and now it's a massive uh, uh, playroom. So, so when a child and a caregiver walk in, so we always, you know, have a caregiver who's part of this, and so they'll walk in, and so lots of stimulating toys are all over the place. So, and what I do is I have people sit first, right? And so, of course, kids are looking all over the place. And so, you know, we just describe what therapy is. We get to know each other a little bit. And then how I do it is I take kids on a tour and I show them the different toys. But along the way, I'm explaining what we use the toys for. So such as, you know, I understand you've had some yucky things happen to you be when you lived with your other mommy, you know, if it's a foster care kid, or maybe you had some, you know, difficult things happen in school. And so we use these fun toys as a way to talk about those big feelings. And so that's, so I'm trying to psychoed, as I could provide psychoeducation about trauma as we're touring the playroom. Love that. Yeah. And so then we visit everything. And so then kids, usually the first session, you know, I always say I have an activity that's going to take about 10 minutes and then I have a clock that you put a timer on and so they do it. And I go, so you're, you actually get 20 minutes to figure out what you want to play with today. So one of the great things is, is then kids have many opportunities to find something. They could be drawn to the sand tray and all the miniatures. They could be drawn to the puppets. They could be drawn to all the expressive arts material I have. It's not just drawing, but we've made safe, comfortable places on pillowcases or handkerchiefs. And they just have such a wide variety to choose from. And often their themes are coming out during their play, right? So I had this very anxious little girl who was going into first grade, very, very scared, and so she naturally was drawn to the school bus in the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. And so she got all the kids on the bus. And I could tell this, she was projecting what it was going to be like for her first day of 
first grade. This was summertime therapy. And, um, you know, so I, that's my role now to kind of help her out with that. So I said, oh, I see the kids on the bus. Huh, I wonder how they're feeling. And she says, well, they're nervous. It's the first day. And I go, yeah, they are nervous. So there's, there's, you know, sometimes I'll do questions, sometimes I'm reflecting. And I said, so I wonder how these kids are going to manage how nervous they are. And so she goes, well, they should talk to each other, <laughs> right? So, and it's not like she's not thinking that, but my encouragement helped her to get through the first day of the school bus. Mm -hmm. And then she went to the schoolhouse, did the same exact thing. But there was these moments that the child, who I assume was her, would get stuck, literally frozen, like she couldn't make it in the schoolhouse. And I go, huh, I wonder if there's maybe a teacher that could help her walk in, oh. right? So anyways, the, the the best part of the story, I mean, this was a very high functioning family and the mom called me, you know, after day two and she said, she did great. She did fine. No problems. Mm -hmm. And I said, does she, I mean, there was other things she had come to me for. I said, does she want to come back? And she goes, I asked her, she said she feels really good. And right now she doesn't need to, right? And I, that's, that was uh, over a year ago. So, but you know, anxious kids sometimes will come back, but we had done a lot of work together about how to manage her anxiety. I love that story. And I think the examples really help for, for us yeah. to like see inside, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. you bring the parents into it. I know you said sometimes you bring the parents into it. Or if there's anything that you're doing in in the play therapy room, obviously the parents aren't doing therapy, but are there things that they can learn from you? I'm, I'm asking for someone, uh, a friend, <laughs> are there things that us parents can be doing at home that sort of resemble some of that, maybe more non-directed, where we could get a closer relationship with our children? It's interesting because I think parents always want to be teaching. Um, and that kind of Q&A style of parenting, like, oh, what color is this? And, you know, all of that can be, uh, sometimes the narrative then is all about the parent and the parent's goals. And our kids are so overstructured and like achievement oriented anyway, that, the, you know, the the benefit of letting your child kind of show you what they want to play. And, you know, the classic play therapist stance is to kind of track and notice and reflect. It's very much an attuned response to say, oh, show me more about that instead of always going along this kind of educational or controlling style of parenting. So it's hard to make the time and space. I know my own kids used to be like, why do you play with other people's kids all day? And then you're too tired to, not to play what I want you to play. So it's, it takes some presence of mind to do it, but I think it's worth it. Can, can I add something in? Because this, this to me really adds an extra flavor to this is that, you know, and again, two thing about the play was, as I heard Anne talking, is that if parents see violent acting out in play, there, most parents will say, oh, honey, that's not nice. You shouldn't, the dolls shouldn't hit each other, right? And so, and that's one important thing is that, you know, I had a parent in the room observing and of course, I'm thinking that she's thinking what I'm thinking, which is let's observe this. And immediately the mother's like, why are you doing that? Why is the one the one miniature attacking the other miniature, right? And so again, shut down the conversation where I was just curious as to why it was occurring, oh, right? Such and a so, good point. <laughs> right, same curiosity. And then the other thing is if a kid has a bad day or if some if a teenager shares something, and this is what we do with each other. You know, you know, Lara, if you told me you had a bad day, I'd listen for 10 seconds and I'd go, well, Lara, you should try this. Uh, maybe you should try that. Maybe you should, try, right? We are, we give each other advice and it's an, it's a very insulting way of conversing with someone. And so if somebody, even in day to day, if they say, you know, I had a bad day and they start to talk about it, don't give them answers or suggestions. Just listen right? Most of us know how to manage our life, right? We just want to vent about something that happened, right? And for kids, they sometimes just want to talk about it. And they, they're they not always needing a way 
to solve it. And it, and especially to teens, when parents start going, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you try that? I think it's just not what we're, what, what is needed. Yeah. It closes them off. Closes us all off. Yeah. Closes us all (laughs) off. I know I need to vent (laughs) without the problem being solved. Such a good point. Yeah. 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 So I love to dig in a little a little more about what you do when children are avoiding going into the more difficult things that we know they they need to go there in order to process the traumatic event, how you help them to go there. And I know you two use a very specific brand of play therapy that incorporates EMDR. So this was the first time I've heard of it and it's it sounds pretty incredible. Yeah. And this really came from my own experiences of being a play therapist. And some kids would use the play to kind of work through some of the elements of the traumatic experience, whether it was the feelings or beliefs about themselves, like was it their fault or not? And you could just see in the play, they call it post-traumatic play. You could see in the play that they're trying to work out the details. But for every kid like that, there were other kids that had significant traumatic experiences that would just come in and play like sunshine and bunny rabbits. And, you know, we weren't going near the stuff. And so I became more prescriptive, which is a term in play therapy for, you know, when the therapist is, has made some decisions about where things need to go and either with a light touch or a little firmer hand might direct the activities in the session. And so, you know, it's a dance, right? Where I have to, I'm sharing some control, but I'm trying to get kids that opportunity to start to connect to the upsetting feelings and either in play. And now in EMDR, because we know that EMDR works so well and so quickly at relieving some of the distress and enabling things to get back on track and enabling like the important information that's often missing in trauma is you know, I did the best I could, or, you know, I really, um, that's in the past, but my body feels like it's happening right now. And so using the EMDR processing to kind of support the play or to bridge back and forth between the child's, you know, play narrative of what happened is really powerful. And it's important because we don't want to let kids sit too long with unprocessed trauma because it's interfering with their development. It's interfering with their life. I would love to hear how this looks for a teenager. Sure, sure. So teens are, you know, obviously many adults and they're not really, they're also many children, which they they don't like to hear, right? So, you know, with teens, we are sometimes using this method of just me and them, but I have really started to include parents more and more over the years of being in practice in part because what I'm finding is when parents really hear the depth of pain inside of their child, they tend to be more compassionate and sympathetic and empathetic. And they tend to have a job now of repairing maybe what's happened for the child. And so it's just something that I have really kind of stumbled on. I've had a a few resistant parents who say things like, you know, he's just being manipulative. And and where really it is, it's just trauma wounds that are unresolved and the kid is just acting out strong feelings. And so by having a parent involved hearing the trauma, even if the parent knows what the trauma is, but hearing it, hearing the depth of pain can really help them be more supportive and caring and very much there for the child. And where really it's Getting teens to do these kinds of things are the most challenging part of this intervention because not even just teens, but none of us want to talk about the bad things that have happened to us. So it's it's a lot to get a teen on board. And what I do with teenagers a lot is look to their future. I say, oh, let's talk about who you want to be in 10 years. And, you know, I mean, sometimes it's a realistic version. Sometimes it's not. But it doesn't matter because once kids, teens in particular, can see a way out of their feelings, then they are more likely to work harder. And I always tell the story of he's a teenager that really never learned to use the bathroom properly. 
And so he would often poop in his pants and very depressed kid, very sad kid, lots of strong feelings, lots of behavioral issues. And, you know, he was this kid that I had to have him see in the future. And I'd say things like, you know, do you think when you are, you know, like 22, you think this is still going to be happening to you? And so he would look at me like, and he'd be like, no, (laughs) you know, right. Even though we hadn't solved the problem, but but he started to dream. He started to really dream about his future. And he became much more willing to engage with me to process some of the traumas that were part of why this was going on for him. So I'm always teaching people if, you know, you want to get somebody better, they have to see who they, they have to see their future self. They have to look through the eyes of the future self. Um, that's amazing. I'm right. I'm taking notes. <laughs> that is that is such a great takeaway. Well, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to be kind of funny, but not really. But, you know, Anne and I really work all the time together to see our future selves. Mm, like, yeah. who do we want to be? How do we want to help people, kids, teens, therapists on a very deep level? And her and I often dream together and manifest. And I can tell you that a lot of what we've put out to the, you, I always say put it out to the universe has come true because we just see ourselves and then we work towards it. No, I really believe in that. I mean, I, I developed a, I have a life purpose planner where you put in how you see yourself at the end of the year first, (laughs) and then you, you fill it out backwards basically. And I've used that technique on myself. Like I was, getting in a lot of bad relationships. And I was kind of in my mid thirties. And I was like, I did this visualization of how I want to see myself at 40. And it was like in a stable thing, you know, with a partner. And it happened really fast after that. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. And you think about many of us who've made it through college, we did dream it one day, right? Yeah. We dreamed it. We're like, well, I'm going to get a degree in some, you know, whatever is in our mind. And then, yeah, then it happens. Yeah. So, well, that's, that's yeah. very helpful. As we think about future selves, I wonder if you want to share, um, first of all, a little bit about the, the book that you both put out and where you see your work headed as we, as we come to our close. So our book was a a dream. (laughs) It was some, it was the future self. And Anne and I one day said, we have to put this in writing. And we just really started to contact 19 authors all over the, the world that we really felt needed to be in this book. This book is EMDR in the, in the playroom. And so it's an integrated approach between play therapy and EMDR. And so it covers many chapters on attachment, dissociation. We give intervention. It's lots of great stuff. So our dream came true and people love it because it's not just us writing the book. It's so many talented people with different things to say about how to do this work with kids. So we are like a family now and we actually have put on a, a conference to bring together all these EMDR and child therapists that really want to be with each other to talk more how to do this. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Hard work getting all those people together, I'm sure, but well worth it. It is. And it's hard for the therapist to lead them there, which is sometimes why we like to just say, oh, I'm (laughs) child-centered, because it's really hard to say, okay, here, it's Tuesday. Let's tell the story of one of the hardest things that ever happened to you. That's a challenging role for the therapist. But if we don't do those things, we're leaving kids to sit with stuff that needs healing. And finally, maybe you can tell me about the conference that you put on with all the people that were in the book. It was, it wasn't really a conference or a online education. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, well, last year, yeah, last year we had a summit of the first playful EMDR summit. So these are all play therapists or child therapists who are using EMDR in their work with trying to integrate creative approaches like play and um, sand tray and art and things like that. And it was the first time we'd really ever been together in person. Um, The community that kind of grew up around our book and then, you know, was starting to find each other during COVID online. We met in person 
Now this fall, we're doing a virtual summit to try to get some of those folks back together. Um, and we're excited, it's gonna be in September. It'll be uh, four evenings and we're hoping to offer some alternatives to people who can't get away from work during the day. Also for some global connection, um, that's a better time than the middle of the night for Australia and other places where there are EMDR therapists who are working playfully and want to be a part of things. So we have sand, great sand tray presenter, Teresa Fraser is going to talk about sand tray and EMDR. And then we each have a session. So Jackie Flynn is the other host along with Annie and I. And um, and this is all to kind of tide us over until 2024, where we're hoping to have another in-person uh, conference. So. Yeah, well said. And we will link your book and your website in the show notes so people can find you and learn more about uh, play therapy and your I think very special <laughs> brand or blend of, <laughs> of play therapy and EMDR. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. It was really wonderful. As we buzz around the busy world, it becomes clear there are billions of paths. As we buzz around the busy world, we will appear in other people's photographs. As we speed through the centuries, we will collide and the light will bend. We will be accidentally immortalized in someone else's land.